Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. Lawrence. Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned, is an anime television film produced by Toei Animation that was originally released as Yami no Teo Keiyu Ketsuki Dorakura in the year 1980. A rough translation would actually come out to mean Dracula, Vampire Emperor of Darkness. Harmony Gold of Robotech fame would release an English adaptation of the film by the year 1983. Dracula Sovereign of the Damned is the first Marvel animated film based on the Marvel comic book series Tomb of Dracula. Based on Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, writers Stan Lee and Roy Thomas envisioned the basic conception of Dracula for Marvel Comics, and writer Jerry Conway and artist Gene Colan implemented that vision in the very first issue of Tomb of Dracula by the tail end of the year 1971. I read somewhere that you based Dracula's look on Jack Palance. Oh, he was a dead ringer for Dracula, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> dead ringer. And so I, I used him as a model for Dracula, and believe it or not, about a year later, after he did Jekyll and Hyde, he did Dracula as well. However, some official Marvel handbooks would point to the comic book Suspense, issue number 7, from the year 1950 as the first technical appearance of Dracula, since it comes from Marvel's publishing predecessor, Atlas Comics. Despite the somewhat recent revision, the Dracula that appears in Suspense would seem to be wholly unrelated to the Dracula that makes his first appearance in the premiere issue of Tomb of Dracula. The way artist Gene Colan envisioned his Dracula turned out to be prophetic, as he felt Jack Jack Palance would make a great Dracula and patterned his art after the actor. Later in 1974, Palance would star as the Lord of the Vampires in a television movie that aired on the CBS network. I am Dracula, not the fool you've seen in your entertainment media. That Cretan is a buffoon some foolish writer created after stealing my diary. I am Vlad Dracul, the world's greatest warrior. I have been called a murderer, but in my country, I was a patriot. I rooted out the Turks who invaded us. I secured my country's borders. It was only then some damnable gypsy turned me into a vampire. The origins of Dracula in Marvel Comics and the anime both start with the notion that the story begins with the historical figure Vlad Zepish, or Vlad the Impaler. The story that Dracula may live again from the pages of the black and white magazine Dracula Lives, issue number two, released in the year 1973, starts from this point. But in the Marvel magazine, he is sired by an old gypsy medicine woman who turns out to be a vengeful vampire. In the case of the anime film, Satan himself resurrects Zepish as the eternal prince of vampires, Dracula. I remember the first time I ever made a connection between the historical figure and the fictional character was in the 1992 film Bram Stoker's Dracula from Francis Ford Coppola. Also, despite Mike Mignola's protestations that he doesn't do well with caricatures of the actors, he and writer Roy Thomas created a wonderful comic book adaptation of the film. There's also the relatively recent film Dracula Untold, which I found to be quite an enjoyable origin story, detailing the descent of Vlad the Impaler from National Hero to Lord of the Vampires. In the city of Boston, a satanic cult, the Scions of Satan, or the Black Mass Cult as they are called in the Harmony Gold dub, prepare to offer a female sacrifice to their object of worship. 
when Dracula arrives, having fled from Europe to Boston. He appears to be the answer to the cult's prayers. Since they mistake the Lord of Vampires for Satan himself, they offer up their visitor a new bride. With his glowing red eyes of persuasion, Dracula takes the form of a bat and spirits the girl away. The cult leader, Anton Lupeski, first appears inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 45, by the year 1976. While the Harmony Gold English dub refers to Dracula's bride-to-be as Dolores, in the Japanese language version and original comic book, her name is actually Domini. Domini makes her debut within the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 45, by the year 1976. And now, let all hearts join in joyous praise of Dolores, Bride of Satan! Hail Dolores, Bride of Satan! <gasps> Hail, Hail Dolores! Hail, 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 Dolores. Hail, Hail to the mighty Lucifer! Lucifer. The notion of Satan and Dracula competing against one another for a mortal bride tends to remind me of the final season of Penny Dreadful where Dracula finally makes his play for the soul of Vanessa Ives. Satan first shows up to confront the Lord of Vampires inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue 63 by the year 1977. With all the various versions of Satan and Lucifer in the Marvel Universe, one is hard-pressed to point to any particular comic book as his first appearance. Mystic Comics, issue number 4, from the year 1940, would introduce the Golden Age Black Widow, who was brought back from death to serve as the supernatural agent of, you guessed it, Satan himself. The Satan that torments the souls of Doctor Doom's mother in Astonishing Tales and Johnny Blaze in Marvel Spotlight is later retconned to be Mephisto from the pages of the Silver Surfer. The true name of the father of Damien Hellstrom, the son of Satan, is revealed as Marduk Curios inside the pages of Warren Ellis's Hellstorm, Prince of Lies by the year 1994. Possibly the one they call Lucifer Lightbearer from the 2006 Ghost Rider is the real McCoy. However, Journey into Mystery, issue 627 from the year 2011, would appear to indicate that Satan's throne has long been abandoned, and that all others are merely pretenders to the throne. Whether this is Mephisto, Marduk Curios, or Lucifer Lightbearer himself, in the anime, Satan is none too pleased that Dracula has absconded with his intended bride-to-be and vows vengeance in the presence of the cult leader, Bishop Anton Lupeski. Patience, mortal! When the time is right, we'll fix Count Dracula! What do you mean? How long do we have to wait to get our revenge? I have a very special sort of revenge planned for our dear friend, Count Dracula. I promise a revenge more cruel than you can imagine, but you are not to move against Dracula for one year, understand? I hear and I obey. Count Dracula, beware! When Dracula takes Domini away, his intent is to make her his immortal vampire bride. However, he finds himself unable to go through with his plan due to the pangs of love he finds himself feeling for the girl. There is a similar sequence inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 47, where Dracula also declares his love for Domini and is unable to bring himself to crush her throat. How can it be possible for a creature such as I to feel such a tender emotion as love? It can't be. But I must have blood. I can't. But I must have blood! Instead, Dracula preys on a number of random women to satiate his bloodthirst. The next day, one of his victims, whose skin has turned a cold blue hue, is shown on a television broadcast at a local bar. The report catches the eye of one Frank Drake. Frank gets a call at the bar from a mystery woman who he's about to write off until she reveals that she is aware of his secret ancestry. Too bad. You got a nice voice, and I'm curious about your looks. But it's just like I've been saying, Frank Drake isn't into mysteries, Buttercup. But Mr. Drake, or may I call you Mr. Dracula? Huh? What's that? 
Drake meets up with this mystery woman and her colleague at the park, who turn out to be Rachel Van Helsing and Hans Harker. As the descendants of the great vampire hunters, Abraham Van Helsing and Jonathan Harker, they want Drake, whose family name was changed from Dracula, to assist them in their hunt. Frank Drake first appears inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number one by the year 1971. In the comic books, Drake is a well-to-do playboy who has squandered his inheritance. He looks to sell his ancestral castle in Transylvania to recoup his losses and unwittingly unleashes Dracula onto the Marvel Universe once again. In the anime, Drake is mainly attracted to join his fellow vampire hunters for the promise of a $100,000 retainer. Hmm. That's more money than I made all last week, but I'm afraid it's still not quite enough for me to risk my life for. Bye. <laughs> How about tossing her in as a bonus? Rachel Van Helsing makes her debut within the pages of the Tomb of Dracula issue number three in the story titled Who Stalks the Vampire? by the year 1972. As in the anime, Rachel is quite proficient in the use of a crossbow, which she uses on Drake when he tries to steal a kiss from her as some sort of bonus payment. Interestingly enough, inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 47, this same story beat plays out, not as the two characters are first introduced to one another, but as their longtime romance is coming to an end. If you ever try a trick like that again, I'll put an arrow right through your heart. You understand me? In the Harmony Gold English dub, Quincy Harker's name is changed to Hans Harker, created by Marv Wolfman, who would go on to write the remaining run of the title until the final issue. Quincy Harker makes his first appearance inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number seven in the story titled Night of the Deathstalker by the year 1972. Quincy Harker is named after Quincy Morris, the Texan character involved in the climax of the original Bram Stoker novel. My name is Hans Harker, and I have some rather distressing information about your husband's past, which I think you should know. Quincy's German Shepherd, named Saint in the comics, is called Elijah in the Harmony Gold English dub. Even in the Japanese language version, the dog that was raised to drink holy water and fitted with a crucifix around his collar goes by the name White God. How do you feel about that, Elijah? <laughs> There's an excellent confrontation between Quincy, Saint, and Dracula inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 32, where we can see Saint's dog collar has been fitted with studded crosses that burn Dracula's hands when he goes for the German Shepherd's throat. In the anime, the son of Dracula and Domini is born on Christmas Eve. They name the child Janus, and this directly ties into the 54th issue of Tomb of Dracula from the year 1976 titled Twas the Night before Christmas. Lupesky names the child Janus inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula issue 55 by the year 1977. Soon enough, Lupesky springs a trap for Dracula on behalf of his master, which brings the Dracula family and the vampire hunters together. Now trapped in a church that weakens his power, the vampire hunters and Janus strike. This moment in the film is a direct tie-in to the 59th issue of Tomb of Dracula, where Lupesky shoots at Dracula with silver bullets. Dracula, attempting to avoid the shot, turns into mist, and the bullet hits the baby Janus. Enraged, Dracula slays Lupesky and begins to tear down the entire building. Frank Drake goes all Richard Dragon Kung Fu fighter on Dracula until Domini convinces Dracula to end his assault on the vampire hunters. In the comics, where he crushes Lupesky's head all Roy Batty style, Dracula's killing rage against Harker and the others is more understandable as they conspired with Lupesky rather than just having stumbled upon the scene of the crime like in the anime film. You know people are super pissed off in a Japanese production when they utter this phrase. Fury. As in the 60th issue of Tomb of Dracula from the year 1977, Dracula pours on the melodrama, as if he's going for his Academy Award winning performance clip right here, howling in the pouring rain and fierce lightning.
Mourn him now with storm clouds. All nature must mourn the murder of Janus, my son. While keeping tabs on Domini, who vigilantly visits the grave of her child day after day, Drake, Van Helsing, and Harker observe his miraculous resurrection as a golden-skinned angel. Just as Domini pulls out a large dagger and holds it to herself to commit suicide, a golden angelic light shines on the bride of Dracula. The young child's body is transformed into the very antithesis of his father, as the others look on in deep prayer, having been witness to a bona fide miracle. Strictly speaking, Janus, Zeppish's first appearance from Tomb of Dracula, issue 51, is as an ominous figure hidden in the shadows that Dracula refers to as a harbinger of doom. But by the subsequent issue from the year 1976, we finally see his superheroic blue and white outfit as he confronts Dracula out from under the shadows for the first time. While it's not said outright in the comic books, it's implied that Janus is some kind of super angel sent by Jesus and God to merge with Dracula's child, who had yet to be born at the time. This sequence in the film ties in directly to Tomb of Dracula issue 61 from the year 1977, which features the resurrection of the baby Janus, now transformed into the being destined to bring about the end of his father, Dracula. You must never call me father again, my exalted, heaven-sent, murder-bent, mortal enemy. You're no longer my son, Janus. You're right. It will make it much easier for me to destroy you if I forget that you're my father. When Dracula stalks his next victim, Janus is there to stop him. Transforming from the form of a golden hawk, he flies down to confront his father. As the two battle, Janus unleashes his heavenly eye beams onto the Dark Prince, causing him to transform into smoke and flee the battlefield with a parting gust of flame from the sky. This sequence has some parallels with Tomb of Dracula issue 63, where Janus can also be seen taking the form of a golden hawk and using his eye beams against Dracula in forced combat. But you haven't seen the full extent of the powers of Dracula! Later, Dracula and Domini are spirited away in flames to the realm of Hell itself, where Dracula's immortality is stripped from him for turning against Satan by stealing his bride and conceiving a child of heaven. Patterned after Tomb of Dracula, issue 64, only in the case of the comic book, it is the supporting character from the pages of Werewolf by Night named Topaz, who has the mystical powers to fend off Satan rather than Domini, Dracula's bride, as it is in the film. However, by Tomb of Dracula, issue 65, the end result is the same, and once they are returned to the earthly plane of existence, Dracula has become a mortal, powerless man. <gasps> My image is reflected in the mirror. Meanwhile, over in New York City, we are introduced to another offspring of Dracula. Shifting gender expectations, a girl named Layla turns out to be the vampire, preying on male victims she picks up at dance clubs. Although the Harmony Gold English dub calls the character Layla, in the Japanese language version and original comics, she is known as Lilith, the daughter of Dracula. <laughs> すっかり普通の人間に戻ってしまい、もう一度そのマルコを取り戻そうと、ヴァンパイアライラスの行方を探しに行ったんです。彼女の毒がを喉に打ち込んでもらい。ライラス、ついに見つけたぞ。いくら
Count Dracula, sovereign of all vampires, exhibiting an apparent hunger for ordinary mortal food. Determined to become a vampire once more, Dracula follows Lilith to her apartment and intrudes on Angel O'Hara's sexy shower time escapades. After Dracula knocks out Lilith's intended prey, the curtain bursts open to reveal Lilith herself in full regalia. Dracula, you spoiled my dinner and he's RH positive too. So, what brings you around after all these years and years and years and years? They learn. <laughs> Lilith, daughter of Dracula, not to be confused with Lilith, mother of demons, makes her debut within the pages of Giant Size Chillers, featuring The Curse of Dracula, issue number one, in the story titled Night of the She-Demon by the year 1974. The daughter conceived from Dracula's first marriage back in the 15th century. Lilith was cursed by gypsies to be a vampire that did not fear the sun or the crucifix and would be forever reincarnated to seek out the death of her father. Do you go ahead and pour yourself one. But I don't drink wine. I never drink wine. And I never drink wine. Much like the red-headed female we are first introduced to in the anime, during the era of the Tomb of Dracula comics, Angel O'Hara is the host body for Lilith. Without being overly judgmental, in the best case scenario, Lilith, daughter of Dracula, is most likely inspired by Warren Publishing's character Vampirella, who predates her by about six years. Lilith's refusal to turn the mortal Dracula back into a vampire, and her subsequent attack on his person, are mirrored inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue 67 from the year 1978. I think the best Lilith's ever looked in her 70s attire was the excellent Earl Norum cover from Marvel Preview issue number 12 from the year 1977. Worst case scenario, Lilith is a poor man's vampirella in the Marvel Universe whose look was frequently updated ever since she first debuted in the 70s. There's the creepy suggestion of incest with her next look, which is even more akin to the skin vampirella would show inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula magazine issue number 5 from the year 1980. By the year 1998, inside the pages of Dracula, Lord of the Undead, issue number three, Lilith looks like something I can't quite place, like maybe she stepped off the set of The Matrix, Birds of Prey, Black Scorpion, or the Robert Palmer music video, Simply Irresistible, in a little latex black dress. I also think the David Finch redesign for Lilith from the 2007 one-shot Legion of Monsters, Morbius the Living Vampire, is an incredibly sexy modernization that actually does not bring Vampirella to mind for once. Hello, Miss. As Dracula walks off into the New York night, we can see Satan appearing overhead maniacally laughing, which echoes a similarly themed panel from Tomb of Dracula, issue 68, from the year 1978. Dracula then decides his only option left is to return to his homeland of Transylvania to have one of his former servants re-sire him. However, the servant girl, called Melissa by Harmony Gold, laughs in Dracula's face and refuses him because the Vampire Legion now serve a new master. While the Harmony Gold English dub refers to this new Lord of Vampires as Tomo, in the Japanese language version and original comics, his name is actually Torgo. Torgo is first name dropped by the vampire servant girl, instead called Marissa, inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 68, from the year 1978. While Satan himself has restored Dracula to his vampiric form in the comic books, he is still a mortal human at this point in the anime. Soon surrounded by undead vampire hordes who refuse to obey their former master, Dracula is forced to turn to the aid of young children for sanctuary. This is also chronicled in the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 69, from the year 1979. And the standoff ends in a similar fashion, with Dracula fending off the Vampire Legion clutching a golden crucifix as it burns his own hands. Why his hands burn in the anime when they're still technically those of a mortal human is unknown, but we can probably just chalk that up to inconsistency in matching the film with the comics. 
here, sir. You look like you must be starved to death. Here's some hot soup my mother made. Soup? Don't be a fool! Our lives are in danger! <gasps> There's nothing more, you stupid suit. Can't teach me anyhow. Torgo makes his physical presence known and intends to destroy the mortal Dracula once and for all. Dracula stands his ground and challenges Torgo to a duel to the death. The first and only appearance of Torgo comes inside the pages of Tomb of Dracula, issue number 70, by the year 1979. After taking a brutal pummeling from the new Lord of Vampires, Dracula pushes his hand against Torgo's face, only to find that Torgo's face begins to steam. The scar of the cross that he held off the Undead Legion with has proved to be Torgo's undoing as he dissipates into dust. While Torgo is also slain by Dracula in the comics, by this point, Dracula is already again a vampire and stakes him with his own silver dagger in the heart. Trying to get the anime back on the same track as the comic book storyline from Tomb of Dracula, issue number 70, Dracula is magically again returned to the form of a vampire once he reaches his castle, just in time for his final showdown with Quincy Harker. back again. Once more I am master of vampires and lord sovereign of the damned. It must be the air in my castle that restored me. As Harker and Dracula have their final battle, the anime makes you wonder if the wheelchair was just for show all these years as Harker stands up to confront Dracula. The comic also sees the wheelchair-bound Harker stand, but makes it very clear he's in great pain and can only manage to do this just for a few moments. Just like the comics, Harker finishes off Dracula with a wheelchair spoke made of pure silver and sets off explosive charges in his wheelchair, destroying not only himself and Dracula, but the entire castle. Dracula, The epilogue sees happy endings for Frank Drake and Rachel Van Helsing, as well as Domini, who has her baby Janus returned to her. While this is also true of the epilogue to Tomb of Dracula issue number 70, in the ongoing narrative of comics, happy endings don't tend to last. After the conclusion of the comic book series Tomb of Dracula, Dracula would return again in the short-lived magazine version by the year 1979. However, the Montessi formula storyline ran through issues 59 to 62 of Doctor Strange and effectively ended all vampires in the Marvel Universe. For a time. Sadly, Frank Drake and Rachel Van Helsing's happy ending was not to last either, as Van Helsing is turned into a vampire by Dracula. Inside the pages of X-Men King Sized Annual, issue number 6, from the year 1982. The annual was a follow-up to Uncanny X-Men issue 159, where Dracula seduces Aurora Monroe, also known as Storm. Although Van Helsing ultimately rejects the influence of the Lord of Vampires, the way they have Wolverine stake Rachel as the sun comes up seems to serve as Wolverine a hell of a lot more than it does Rachel Van Helsing. Rubbing salt on the wound, the 1991 Tomb of Dracula miniseries from Marvel Comics' epic imprint subtitled Day of Blood, Night of Redemption, not only suggests suggests that Rachel turned into an easily seduced, broken-down drunk, but that she was killed by some random vampires in the back of an alleyway. Reading something like that hasn't made me feel as bad about the ignominious end of a strong female character since Sharon Carter was killed off-panel by showing Captain America her death on a VHS tape. There's also the somewhat Jean Grey, Maddie Pryor-esque, X-Men-like notion that Frank Drake's new wife, Marlene, is either somehow possessed by the spirit of Rachel Van Helsing, or is somehow the reincarnation of Rachel Van Helsing. It's a disturbing book with dubious canonicity that is probably best left forgotten. 
I've waited a long time for this moment, Dracula. Frank Drake, of course, continued on as the leader of the Night Stalkers, a group of vampire hunters reimagined in the 90s during the Ghost Rider mega event, Rise of the Midnight Suns. Frank Drake's final fate is also somewhat inglorious, having never been actually committed to the printed page. From what I can tell, the crap fest that was Blade the Vampire Hunter was canceled by issue 10 in the year 1995. From the letters page, we're shown the covers to the unpublished issues 11 and 12, and we can see that Drake was apparently to have been merged with his vampire partner, Hannibal King, and the current version of Dracula from the title. In an attempt to resolve the unresolved, the one-shot Blade Crescent City Blues from the year 1998 reveals that Hannibal King and Frank Drake survive an explosion that returns the two to their separate forms. However, Frank Drake hasn't spoken a single word ever since that incident, and it's insinuated his mind has left the building, so to speak. To end on a somewhat decent note, there was a nice nostalgic flashback to Drake's days as a Night Stalker, inside the pages of The Amazing Spider-Man 699.1 by the year 2012. How about it? <laughs> You're out of your ever loving skull. Marvel's Dracula would go on to have a significant presence in a variety of animated media and films. In the year 1983, Firestar would be seduced by a suave Empire State University exchange student who turns out to be the Lord of Vampires in the Spider Man and His Amazing Friends episode titled The Bride of Dracula. Much like his failed attempt to woo Storm a year earlier in Uncanny X-Men, Firestar isn't interested in what the Big D is selling. You, you are Firestar. And you are staying single. <laughs> Even though the first issue of Giant Size Spider-Man from 1974 was later reprinted in 1994 as Spider-Man vs. Dracula, Spider-Man, ironically, never confronts the Lord of the Dam. In fact, only Peter Parker crosses the path of Dracula, with neither party aware of who they've just bumped into. It wouldn't be until the year 1997 that Spider-Man himself would actually confront Dracula inside the pages of Spider-Man Team-Up, issue number 6. By the year 2004, Marvel's Dracula had made his live-action feature film debut in the movie Blade Trinity. The big bad of the third film in the franchise, the character took the name Drake as a nod to his comic book roots, but otherwise the character bore little resemblance to his comic book counterpart from the Tomb of Dracula series of the 70s. I love the 70s. A more classic interpretation can be seen in the Superhero Squad show episode This Man-Thing, This Monster by the year 2011. Iron Man, Man-Thing, and Werewolf by Night team up to face off against Dracula. Even the title card for the episode replicates the cover to Tomb of Dracula issue number one. A few years earlier, in 2009, one of the last great classic-looking Tomb of Dracula stories was told by Paul Cornell inside the pages of Captain Britain and MI-13. Even Quincy Harker's skull makes an appearance, as he used his soul to power a spell that would make sure vampires couldn't enter his homeland without being invited. The Vampire State storyline ran through issues 10 through 15, and sees Dracula staging a vampire invasion on all of Great Britain from the blue area of the moon. Tell me more about Dracula. The one-shot comic book, Death of Dracula, from the year 2010 by Dracula's new shepherd, writer Victor Gishler features a brand new look for The Prince of Darkness by artist Giuseppe Comencoli. While it is difficult to reconcile Gishler's vision of Dracula, not to mention his reinterpretation of Dracula's son Janus as a pure-blood vampire as opposed to an angelic defender, this new-look Dracula has been the standard visual for Marvel's Dracula ever since. The one-shot led into a rather entertaining X-Men event titled Curse of the Mutants that featured an uneasy yet engaging alliance between between Cyclops and the New Look Dracula. New Look Dracula's first animated appearance comes in the Avengers Assembled episode titled The Avengers Protocol by the year 2013. Gishler's Dracula would go on to become a member of the Red Skull's Cabal on that series, alongside fellow villains Modok and Atuma. 
While the anti-Avengers group, the Cabal, is one of the few storylines that actually engaged me as a viewer on Avengers Assemble, Dracula's other appearances in the Disney XD Marvel animated program block were not as much to my liking. On the Ultimate Spider-Man TV series, we'd see the Prince of Darkness facing off against Blade and the very literal Howling Commandos. Meanwhile, on Hulk and the Agents of Stupid, I mean, Agents of Smash series, a time-traveling Hulk encounters Count Dracula in 1890 London. Count Dracula? Didn't the Avengers Assemble show just establish that Cap says he doesn't like to be called Count Dracula? A Count Dracula? Come on, we're talking the I want to drink your blood guy, right? Not Count, just Dracula. He finds Count insulting since he's king of the vampire nation. You can't just walk around. Oh, I... The most recent and possibly final appearance of Dracula in Monster War sees Old Man Logan decapitate the Lord of the Damned, and for good measure, he has their pet sentinel, Cerebra, somewhat definitively chuck his head into the sun. Good luck to whichever writer tries to follow up on reversing that particular demise. Decisive enough for you, vampire. If you're not with me, you're against me. In some cases, I believe the film Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned is at times unfairly criticized for either being silly or unfaithful to the source material. I would tend to argue that in examining the original Japanese language version, most of the characters' names are identical to the Marvel Comics source material. It's only after Harmony Gold gets its little grubby hands on the property that names begin to drastically change. Plus, if the anime is ridiculous and silly, then so too is the highly regarded run of comic books from Marv Wolfman and Gene Cole as many sequences and moments are lifted wholesale and plucked from their uninterrupted tenure on the title Tomb of Dracula. If anything, the most justifiable criticism can be pointed at the pacing and patchwork nature of the adaptation from the Japanese filmmakers, which simply doesn't appeal to Western audiences of the day. There is also the matter of the lack of trust from Harmony Gold and many other uninformed internet reviewers that feel those same Japanese filmmakers didn't actually know the source material they were adapting. To sum up, if you have any interest in early Western adaptations of Japanese anime, or are a big fan of the tail end run of Marvel Comics Tomb of Dracula, this is certainly worth a look. However, if you could care less about either, you probably could give this flick a pass. Son of Frankenstein! <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. I am the Count Dracula. <laughs> Please step inside. Do not be frightened. I will not harm you. Come and listen to the music. Get the light and velvet.
Let me sing a few lines with my little vampire. 